Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video I'm going to be going through an example on how to design a retaining wall. This example is taken from the book Reinforced Concrete Design by Mosley and Bungie. I highly recommend this book and it's actually one of the few books which I actually bought. If you do want to buy yourself a copy I'll leave a link to it in the description below. Okay, so let's get straight into the example and this is going to be a fairly standard retaining wall supporting some granular fill. And when you're designing a retaining wall there's basically three things which you need to check. That's the stability of the wall, the bearing pressure and then designing the concrete bending reinforcement. So let's check stability and first let's work out the horizontal forces acting on the retaining wall. There's something called active and passive pressure and because we're adding granular fill we need to know what the active pressure of this granular fill is, and that's denoted by the coefficient Ka. In this instance, because it's granular fill, it's going to be 0.33. There are two horizontal forces acting on our wall, one from the earth pressure, or the soil, and a second from a surcharge. The surcharge is essentially just for live load, and if you imagine someone walking behind the retaining wall, that person is surcharging the retaining wall. So to work out the pressure behind the wall due to the soil, we use the equation Ka rho GH. Ka is the active pressure, rho is the density of the granular soil, G is gravity and H is the height. Plug the numbers into the equation and you get 27 kilonewtons per meter squared. Lateral earth pressure is distributed onto the wall as a triangle. Next we need to calculate the lateral force due to the surcharge, which in this case is 10 kilonewtons per meter squared and all you do is multiply 10 by the coefficient of active pressure to get 3.3 kinetons per meter squared. And this acts uniformly over the wall, so essentially it's a rectangle. So now we can actually work out the horizontal force from the pressures we had just calculated. And this is over a one meter length of wall, so essentially all we're trying to do is work out the force, which is the area of the triangle or area of the rectangle. So for the earth pressure, it's half base times height, so it's half times the pressure, times the height and the force due to the surcharge is just base times height. Okay so now we can work out some of the vertical loads and that's just going to be the self weight of the retaining wall so you've got to work out the wall, the base and then you've got the soil pressure that's obviously got a vertical element to it and then also the surcharge. Okay so the first stability check is the overturning check. Now we're going to be taking moments about the point A at the edge of the toe which if you didn't know was the front of the retaining wall and the heel is at the rear of the retaining wall. So when you're dealing with overturning moments, you want to multiply up the unfavorable forces and the dead load factor is 1.1 and the live load factor is 1.5. Now with the restraining or the restoring moment, which is actually a favorable force, we want to apply a reduction factor of 0.9. Now we only do this with the dead load and we completely ignore the live load. So we calculate that the restoring or restraining moment is significantly greater than the overturning moment so that means that the design for overturning is absolutely okay. Next we move on to the sliding check. So first we want to calculate the factored horizontal forces and this is just simply 1.35 times the dead and 1.5 times the live or the surcharge. Next we want to calculate the frictional resisting force by multiplying the coefficient of friction by the vertical forces. We can see that the resisting force is less than the applied sliding force. Therefore we need to use the heel beam and the passive pressure to increase the frictional resisting force. Using a heel beam is generally not very economical, but for the sake of this design example, we'll go through it. The additional frictional force is very, very easy to calculate. And all you really need is the coefficient of passive pressure. And in this case, we're assuming it's 3.5 for granular material. And just like you worked out the horizontal force for the earth pressure, you basically do exactly the same calculation except you're substituting in a different H value and the passive pressure coefficient. Add the two forces together and you will see that it marginally exceeds the sliding force, therefore the design passes. So now that we've done with the stability check, now we need to check what the bearing pressures are. So in a similar way in how we calculated the bending moments, 
when we did the check for overturning, we need to find the moments about the base center line. So the moments due to earth pressure and the surcharge is basically exactly the same as when we did it for the overturning check. What's slightly different is because of where we're taking moments, the weight of the stem is going to be additive to the earth pressure and the surcharge moments. So the lever arm between the center line of the base and the stem is 1.7 minus 1. Then we multiply it by the vertical force or the vertical weight of the stem. And we need to work out the bending moments due to the vertical weight of the soil, but this acts in the opposite direction, so we're giving it a negative sign. So the lever arm of the weight of the soil is basically the center of mass to the center of the base. And this should be 2.2, not 2.3, minus 1.7. The difference is pretty negligible, so we'll just continue with their numbers in the textbook. Then we can apply all the correct safety factors, so 1.35 for dead, 1.5 for live, and we also apply 1 if it's a favorable effect. In this case, because we want the largest bending moment, we're putting a factor of 1 against the negative bending moment. Now that we've worked out the moment, we can plug in the actual force, the moments into the stress equation to get two values of stress, 152.2 and 3.2. Now we can move on to calculating the bending reinforcement in the wall and the base. So the biggest bending moment in the wall is going to be at the base of the wall. So therefore we're going to take moments about the base of the wall. So once you've worked out your bending moment, we also need to work out the effective depth before we can calculate the area of steel required. The wall thickness at the base of the stem is 400 mil. In this example, they're assuming that the effective depth is 330, so therefore the cover is going to be around 60 mil and the bars we're using is 20. If you want a more detailed video on how to calculate the cover, I suggest you go check out my reinforcement beam design video. And once you've got your effective depth, you should basically just plug in the numbers into this equation and then you get an area of steel required. Then you want to specify a size of bar and the centers, and this will give you your AS provided, and as long as you're providing more than the required, then your design is more than adequate. Okay, so now we're moving on to calculating the base reinforcement, and we want to start by looking at the reinforcement at the heel. So we're going to be taking moments about the center line of the stem, so we're first calculating the self weight of the base multiplied by the lever arm and that lever arm is the distance between the center of the base to the center line of the stem. Then we want to do a similar calculation with the vertical load of the earth and the lever arm in this instance is 1.3 meters. This next part is quite confusing so I'm going to overlay a diagram of me doing this and it's essentially working out areas and then multiplying by the lever arm again. But it's the working out of these areas which is confusing by just looking at the numbers. So what I'm doing is drawing the stress diagram but to slightly more of a scale. And then we're working out the stress at the face of the wall. So first of all I'm going to work out the bending moment due to the stress of the rectangle in red. And because it's a rectangle the resultant force acts in the middle of the rectangle. So we know that the resultant force is 2.2 divided by 2 and to get to the center line of the stem we need to add 200 mil. So therefore the lever arm is 2.2 divided by 2 plus 0.2 which gives us 1.3. So now we need to calculate the moment due to the remaining stress which happens to be this blue triangle. And because it's a triangle the resultant force acts a third of the way from the wall. Therefore, the lever arm is 2.2 divided by 3 plus 0.2. So in both instances, we're multiplying the area of the triangle or the area of the rectangle by the lever arm. So like with the stem, once we've got the bending moment and once we've calculated the effective depth, we can calculate the area of steel required and then provide the adequate amount of reinforcement. In this case, we're providing H20s at 250 mil centers. Now that we've worked out the bending moment at the heel, we need to do the same thing with the toe. It's a very similar calculation to calculating the heel, so hopefully you can follow it. We then do a quick check to see what the minimum steel required is, and to make sure that we provide reinforcement which is greater than the minimum. And this wraps up the design tutorial. 
The one thing the textbook example doesn't check is checking the bearing pressure against what the soil can actually resist. So on a real project, you'll be given an allowable bearing pressure from the geotechnical engineer or the geotechnical report. And basically what you calculated via the bearing pressure or what's applied from the wall, you just want to make sure that that maximum value is less than the allowable bearing pressure. Hopefully you found this useful. And if you've got any comments, please leave me a comment. Please remember to like and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers.